Good evening, um, everyone. And whether you're joining us um, online or you're with us in person at Stevenson Way, thank you very much for being here to support um, this collections evening. Um, it's almost exactly two years since uh, we were forced to cancel our collections evening on the 17th of March 2020 um, by the start of the coronavirus pandemic. Um, we were subsequently able to hold that event online later that year, followed by another collections evening in 2021, which was also online only. Um, it was important that those events were able to go ahead in one form or another, but we're delighted that we can once again welcome guests to this event at Stevenson Way, not least because the opportunity to see some of our collections at first hand was one of the original motivations for holding these occasions. Um, in addition to giving people a chance to see some of our collections at close range, we also want to show how they are being used, catalogued and conserved. Um, this is especially important right now, as we want people to see that the society and its library are open for business um, and that despite the interruptions of the past two years, work with the collections has been able to continue. Um, throughout the pandemic, we opened our uh, reading room um, for researchers whenever government restrictions um, allowed us to do so. And we also carried on with the other behind the scenes activities which form such a large proportion of activity at any library or archive. Um, I apologise for my own rustiness in introducing the event as a consequence of not having live events for so long. Um, <laughs> but I realise I forgot to actually introduce myself. Um, and some, of, some of you, particularly online, may not know, I'm Edward Weech and I'm the uh, librarian here at the RAS. Um, the Society relies on uh, volunteers to help us uh, with the cataloguing and conservation of our collections. Um, and the pandemic did not stop us from operating our volunteer programme whenever it was safe to do so. Uh, we remain immensely grateful to all the volunteers who have continued uh, to generously donate their time and expertise to help us look after our collections. And we also owe a debt to all those scholars whose insights based on the latest research help us understand our collections in new ways and interpret them for the general public. And as the society builds towards its bicentenary um, celebratory programme of, of events next year, I know we'll be relying more than ever before on our volunteers and our members and supporters um, to help us um, uh, understand and promote, uh, maximise the impact of our historic collections. Uh, this evening, we are extremely fortunate to welcome three speakers who have, over the past uh, year, engaged with the Society's collections in different ways and in different capacities. Um, each of them, however, is united by their dedication, commitment um, and enthusiasm. And I'm sure that we'll find much in what they have to say that will educate us while also demonstrating how much enjoyment and inspiration um, there is to find amid the riches of the society's library and archive. So the format of this evening's proceedings will be three presentations um, and we are planning to have an um, opportunity for question, um, questions and answers at the end of the three presentations, um, after which there will be opportunity for those here in person um, to um, enjoy some refreshments and, and ask uh, follow-up questions in a more um, intimate capacity. Um, and we, I, we will also um, time permitting, open up the reading room again to show um, uh, some of the maps that Philip is going to be talking about in his, in his presentation. So I will proceed to introducing our first speaker, Philip uh, Jagesar, 
um, who was awarded his uh, PhD in geography at the University of Nottingham last year, um, which was a study of Sir George Grierson's linguistic survey of India. And Philip's previous degrees were from UCL and King's. Um, and while Philip um, has mastered the geographical arts, um, I also know from our conversations that he is an erudite and sophisticated historian. Um, so uh, last year, Philip was awarded a Harley Fellowship to survey the society's map collection, um, which is a severely, hitherto a severely understudied um, and underappreciated um, collection. Um, and this evening, he is going to share with us some of his most exciting discoveries. So, Philip, would you like to come up? Okay, you can Where's the book? Pointer, pointer. That's good. All right, thank you. I'll get started. Um, um, yeah, so, um, yeah, thanks to Ed for that introduction. So, as he mentioned, um, I didn't, I came to the Matt, um, Royal, Asi Royal, A Royal Asiatic Society map collection by accident. Essentially, while I was doing my PhD on Grierson, he, I, I visited the archive here. And then I noticed that actually this map collection, well, as Ed said, it was being underutilized. And so um, I applied for a Harley Fellowship and then spent last summer and autumn going through the map collection. And essentially to make sense of what the collection contained, but also how it came together. So my interest is very much how the collection comes to be. And so I'll start by introducing the collection and giving a sort of brief overview of its acquisition history, or at least the you know, to the best of my ability from what I can gather. And then I'll focus on the sort of three thematic strengths of the collection, which I've identified as philology, archaeology, and exploration. And many of the maps reflect these three themes. Um, so to give you a sort of rough idea of the size of the collection, it's about 800 maps and 30 atlases. So in one sense, it's not a very large collection. But, but perhaps in its um, uniqueness is in its eclectic um, makeup. And so in that sense, the map reflects the society's many interests, including philological, linguistic maps, historical maps, um, archeological maps, and economic, et cetera, uh, and religious maps or missionary maps. And, um, so, and one of the more interesting things about this collection is, is that it very much correspond, corresponds to the direction of British imperialism. So, so the early, or early collection from sort of when the society started in the first few decades, very, it's very much um, um, made up of maps of the Indian subcontinent, China and the Far East and Southeast Asia. However, as we head towards the um, late 19th century and the early 20th century, there's a sense that the collection is some expands more to the direct and goes more towards the Middle East, the Ottoman Empire, Central Asia, and the Caucasus, which sort of reflects the direction of where sort of British imperial interests was he were heading. Um, so where do these maps come from? Um, there's sort of five key um, sources for the Royal Asiatic Society maps. The first is the East India Company, perhaps unsurprisingly because of its relationship with the society, the founding of the society. Um, so the East India Company was the, provided a, I guess you could say, a sort of standing order of maps from the Indian Atlas series, which were produced throughout the 19th century, starting in the 1820s. Um, and these were produced by the, um, through the East India Company Survey of India. Um, but then, and then this continues when, um, obviously, with the change of, um, when the East India Company is disbanded and it's taken over by the government of India. Um, and they continue, the government of India continues to do donate Indian Atlas sheets 
as well as other survey of India maps. And so sort of key sort of uh, strength of the collection is maps of India. However, the other key source for the, um, map, for the maps in the collection were the donations from members throughout the sort of first few decades. Among them included a, a large quantity of around 70 and 80 maps of Ceylon from Alexander Johnston, which unfortunately no longer, are no longer in the collection, but we can see from the donation records that this must have been a quite a substantial collection of uh, maps of Ceylon. An interesting source for the maps in the collection are um, the foreign members, the so-called foreign members. And these mem um, especially sort of some of its German members, and this includes, for example, Julius Klaproth, uh, quite a famous German linguist, who donated a new, um, copies of his um, linguistic maps from his um, and other maps produced for his historical work on Asia and his um, linguistic atlas work. And, um, and the collection also includes an atlas, the ethnographic atlas of the world produced by the Italian geographer um, Andrea Balbi. Um, in, in the 1820s. So there's that sense that the foreign members were keen to donate their cartographic materials to the society. And finally, the um, other key source for the map collection are other societies. Um, unsurprisingly, the first sort of a, an important, num a number of important maps come from other Asiatic society branches, including a number of maps of the Malay P Peninsula donated by the Singapore branch of the society. Another um, key source is the RGS. So obviously the, the Royal Geographical Society is probably that connection between some of its members, uh, you know, members of both societies. And so especially a number of maps from Central Asia and the Middle East are RGS maps, and some even have ident are identified as from the RGS map room. And another, uh, another key so uh, relationship is um, the Central Asian Society, or today known as the Royal Society for the, um, Asian Affairs. Um, many of their maps were also in the Royal Asiatic Society's collection, and again, often reflecting Central Asia, Russia, the Caucasus, and elsewhere. Um, and so, for, and, I've, um, and, and the fourth um, source is the, a fourth source of maps is the Royal Society itself. And I, I don't, I'm not sure why, but the Royal Asiatic Society has a, has a near complete um, duplicate set of the Indian Atlas maps, which come from the Royal Society. And here I've also shown another map, which was um, donate, a map of the peninsula of Mount Sinai, which was made for the Royal Society of Literature, but donated by the author to the society. So it's very much a sort of wide range of sources for them and behind the map collection. And so moving on to sort of the strengths of the collections or the key themes I've identified, the first one is philology or translation. And obviously that really reflects the society's history as a space for where um, many texts were translated and um, copied and, and published um, in, 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 mo in various vernacular or oriental languages. And the first map I've show, show here is it's quite an intriguing map. It's a British intelligence map, a copy of an Ottoman map of the Hejaz Railway, um, which had been built by the Ottomans or was being built by the Ottomans around this time. Um, this railway is perhaps more famous for its role, or at least the role of the Arabs, um, Lawrence of Arabia and his Arab allies attacking this railway during the war, or before the war. Um, what's interesting about this map, and it's why it's, um, I think it sort of fits the society, sort of, you know, it fits being part of the society, is that it's a, this intelligence officer or who unnamed uh, official has trans transliterated all the Ottoman um, names and geographical names, toponyms, into English. And so, I mean, in that sense, it's not surprising that this map might have found its way into the Royal Asiatic Society, with that sort of relationship with translation. Another sort of a, a series of interesting um, maps in other languages are so, um, part of the Baddeley collection. So the society has a large number of maps from John Baddeley, who's probably more associated with the Royal Geographical Society, but he was an um, author and tra he traveled across the Caucasus in southern Russia. And the society has a large number of his um, Russian maps of the Caucasus in southern Russia. And many of the maps, like the one I've shown here, are Russian maps of the Caucasus, which he himself then translated, perhaps for his own research, perhaps for his publications. But again, 
really fits the sort of historical, the theme of the society, sort of society's research interests. But I, I guess the society was also interested in works which um, standardized geography in Oriental languages. And so this is uh, the society's copy of a, the first edition of uh, Rajendralal's Mitra's uh, quite significant Bengal atlas, in, um, which um, public, um, written in Bengali. Uh, Mitra, who is um, obviously was one of the, uh, I think he was the director of the Asiatic Society of Bengal himself in the 19th century, is closely associated with the Bengali Renaissance of the 19th century. And so this is one of the first sort of vernacular atlases of Bengal, essentially made for students or um, 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 uh, yeah, mainly students. But its significance and the other signif um, the significance of uh, Mitra's work, cartographic work, was in standardizing Bengali place names, and in a sense standardizing the geographical the geography of Bengal in Bengali. And again, not surprised that such an atlas would be um, found in the Royal Asiatic Society collection. The the second theme of the collection, or at least where you see a clear sort of collecting interest is archaeological maps. Um, and that obviously reflects sort of the society's interest in archaeology and antiquity, oriental antiquity. And so this is a, a copy of one of Felix Jones's um, maps, a series called um, Vestiges of Assyria. And the society has a large number of these, um, which, um, so Felix Jones was instructed by the government of India, the government of India through the Survey of India, to produce the first formal surveys of Nimrud, Nineveh, and the surrounding areas, which had only recently been discovered by Austin Laird. And so these maps are some of the first sort of significant surveys of those excavations. And um, yeah, they were published in the journal. I mean, the, the account of the making of these maps was published in the journal. And the society has quite a large collection of these, and they're very, very attractive series of maps. Another set of archaeological, this is a, this particularly fascinating um, hand-drawn map um, of uh, a map of the northern Etai, which is in Egypt, the desert near the um, Red Sea. And it was produced by an, um, an um, English uh, official, but also a um, traveler, Ernest Floyer, who had worked previously in Baluchistan in, in um, India, but was employed by the Khedive of Egypt to um, explore and survey this area. It's the um, story map, which is most interesting. It, it very much reads like uh, a Ryder Haggard adventure novel. Because what Floyer was, well, Floyer was in this region, he had discovered the lost uh, mines of the, the lost Ptolemaic mine, emerald mines. Um, and these are shown here on the second, uh, on the extracted, um, extract of the map. And so when, you know, when I saw this, it very much reminded me of sort of a King Solomon mine story, um, finding these lost emerald mines in Egypt. And this map itself was then published in the Society's Journal in 1891. And the final theme um, sort of uh, reflected in the collection is exploration and especially imperial exploration. Uh, and also obviously perhaps not so surprising considering the society's position in the sort of great um, imperial, um, in, the, in sort of the imperial um, moment. Um, and so this map illustrates the explorations of an um, anonymous explorer codenamed AK, his explorations of Tibet and Mongolia. And but later on identified as famous pundit Kishan Singh. Um, and so the the were obviously immortalized by Kipling in his work, Kim, were um, these native explorers by the British government during the Great Game to explore areas where British agents would, um, would it perhaps not easily, um, could not easily um, infiltrate. Um, and so Kishan Singh's, this, but this map shows Singh's explorations between 1879 and 1882 and was published in 1884. Um, at a time when he was still operating as a, as a pundit, and therefore these maps were only published with his um, code name, and only later on were they identified as Kishan Singh. Finally, um, 
sort of the final um, map I'm, I'm talking about today is the society was also clearly acquiring maps of the sort of great, uh, of the sort of major imperial events of its time, including a, a series of, mili I, th I think, military maps, or at least maps re um, reflecting sort of military operations of the, in the Northwestern Frontier Province, produced during the Third Anglo-African War. Um, the maps are annotated, and although one cannot be certain, it does, one does wonder whether these maps were used to track the course of the war and the, and the sort of the movement of troops during the um, Anglo-African War. And again, it's not surprising that these uh, maps perhaps ended up in the Royal Asiatic Society. Um, so yeah, that's sort of a brief introduction to the collection, sort of the key themes, and I think Ed would um, probably agree. The collection is there to be used, so feel free to visit and take the maps out and, you know, enjoy looking at them. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we'll we'll be taking um, questions at the end. Um, so um, okay. Um, so our next um, presenter this evening is Ian Herbertson. Um, Ian is Honorary Assistant Librarian at the Oriental Club, um, and he's also been an outstanding volunteer for the Royal Asiatic Society. Um, this evening, Ian will describe how he applied his professional expertise, um, uh, which he will introduce, and his experience of writing a catalogue of the Oriental Club's prints and drawings in order to assess the cataloging, uh, the cataloging history of the Society's own art collection, um, and he will discuss some of his most interesting discoveries during a project that spanned multiple uh, pandemic lockdowns. In. Thank you. Well, good evening, all. Um, my name is uh, Ian Herbertson. Uh, by way of quick introduction, after I retired many years ago, I went to SOAS to pursue a master's in the history of art of East Asia. And then I wanted to apply what I'd learned. So I asked a few people uh, if they had anything going, and I started a couple of projects in March 2019. These two projects were drafting a catalogue of prints and drawings belonging to the Oriental Club and auditing the artwork collection of the Society. Uh, have a technical hitch. Yes. Sorry? Can we get rid of that thing? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So this talk is about the second of these projects. And whilst most overlap between them was of personal interest, some well helped carrying out the other. I did learn how difficult it is to compile a catalogue and consequently became rather sympathetic and non-critical about other catalogues. Now tonight we have two scholarly contributions from Philip and Jean Baptiste. My contribution is not scholarly. It is about the reliability of an important research resource, the society's art collection. Now those of you familiar with Shakespearean tragedies will know that often between two soliloquies, Shakespeare included little comic relief. And my talk may perhaps be seen in that vein. Um, I am a professionally qualified internal auditor and worked as such for 20 years in banking and finance. And I had experience during my MA in using catalogues and over the three years that I worked on these projects, I, learned, I understood a lot more about the practicalities of researching pictures. 
you will know that there are frustrations in trying to unearth information about any artifact. Um, but I started both of these in March 2019 and finished both, as there's a point out, thanks to several lockdowns in October last year. The scope of the project here at the Society was the artwork collections. Boxes of artifacts were supplied by Nancy, our archivist, and I worked through each box one by one, comparing its contents against the two catalogues. The catalogues we have are a book, a catalogue of printings, drawings, and busts by Raymond Head, and the online system with which you're probably familiar, Koha. The value of the project is twofold. It supports the valuable work carried out by the Society's archivist, Nancy, and librarian, Ed. Their work is vital in managing the Society's collections and catalogues for the benefit of researchers. The catalogues are a primary record for research on topics within the Society's purview. So reviewing them for accuracy is important in carrying out the Society's role and for the researchers. In the advertisement for this talk, you were told that I had applied my professional experience to the collections management aspect of the catalogues. But having done so, I can vouch for their accuracy and the sterling work of Nancy and Ed. So this evening, I'm, very, I'm going to cover very briefly what auditing is, because I'm sure you're not that interested in it, but you need to know what I was up to, what I did, what we analysed, what I concluded, and what was reported. Briefly, internal auditing involves looking at the control aspect of the management, who does something, how it's checked and how it's approved, focuses on what can go wrong and avoiding that. Here, going wrong would be losing track of an artifact, omitting it for the catalogues or compiling an incorrect inadequate catalogue entry. So any assessment of controlling that needs to be proportionate and assessed against the risk arising from an Control not being applied or applied properly. We also should look for controls that serve little or no useful purpose. And I found no problems here. So that's what internal auditors do, or at least should do. Now, each artifact has what's known as a head number, which you can see in the head catalogue, and is replicated on the COHA system. The head number is the call number. The format of a head number or call number is three digits and three digits. The first three digits are a collection, and in the head catalogue, they're often overlaid with a collection name, for example, Story or Johnson or Todd. Sometimes the collection name is anonymous, possible Todd, or miscellaneous. And the first control here in the collection management of the artwork is where is its location. So they're stored here with a label. It might sound rather dry, but they're precisely located in downstairs, stack nine, bay one, gel three, left or right. And the process was quite straightforward, as you can see. I was given the boxes, checked one by one. For every box, I checked each artifact against the label's content list to make sure that it was there. I actually sorted each artifact into the box, which is not really what you're supposed to do as an auditor, but I found it much easier get the task done, and it should help people re accessing them in the future. I compared each artifact against the catalogues for presence or absence and reasonableness of description. And I was also asked from a collections management perspective to comment on protection and conservation. So I then compiled a number of spreadsheets, about that thick, you really want to, you can see upstairs, I might mention in passing, I conceived a passionate hatred of spreadsheets during the course of this uh, exercise. So we've, we've been maintained a spreadsheet covering these details. And for every uh, artifact, I wrote a detailed description of, of what I'd found. And I've handed all these records over to Ed and, Ed and Nancy for future reference. The description sheets often contain collateral on earth to support my findings and additional cross-references to other collections, for example, at the Linnaean Society or the British Museum. Some of these entries need no comment, but I'll run through them very quickly. 
So each number has a storage location, so it can easily be found. Has an accession number, the head catalog number, is in the, the book and online. And then I checked whether it was in the catalog, whether it was described, whether it's online, in the description online. Uh, occasionally, I suggested additions or amendments to catalog entries. Rarely, I found discrepancy between the two catalogs. But as an example, and not to give it undue provenance, there's a Daniel print, 09006, which is described in head as views of Calcutta and in Coho as a view of a mosque at Kuanpur. But they do occasionally get out of line. Sometimes, sadly, there was a fruitless search to solve a lack of clarity. Amongst the story collection is an artifact which has an interesting but unclear inscription. It could be the letter Y or U or the Greek letter Mu. I never resolved that one. And some descriptions are written on the artifacts and they're unclear. But there's a set of anonymous prints in which there's a number 845. You think, well, maybe that's a date, date 1845. But it's a conjecture, I'm afraid. There's usually a reference to provenance in the catalogues, and the immediate source of provenance information is often the societies or journals or the nation's books. So I was able to verify that those pieces of information were correct. Sometimes information is written on the back of the artifact, usually anonymously, but also information can be part of the artifact. For example, in an album of pictures, the compiler had included a preface explaining the provenance. Well, that's the sort of thing that can be helpful to researchers. And I was sometimes able to get corroboration of the provenance date by using the watermarks of the paper uh, printed on. But overall, I found provenance information, when available, to be accurate. Uh, the extent of the collection was really dead straightforward. It was just for the archivist's benefits. It was things like the 16 prints or 10 watercolor. This one. I was asked to comment on packaging and housing. Artifacts are stored here in archive boxes, and individual artifacts are either protected by being mounted or through being wrapped in archive paper or both. While I was carrying out the audit, I undertook an appraisal of packaging, housing, conditions, and issues regarding conservation of the garden. At first, I worked very closely with Nancy, but after a time, I got the hang of it myself. I hope I was a good judge of what was okay and what needed attention. Occasionally, I felt it appropriate to suggest extra protection, and once or twice, if I found an artifact to be very fragile, I included a note to that effect in the archive box. On condition, conservation, and best practice, um, I was also asked to comment on these. This is really more for Ed and Nancy for than for inclusion in the catalogues. I rarely felt there was any concern with the artifacts I looked at. What I had occasion to comment on was unremarkable and to be expected, I think. Some artifacts had tears, but this was mostly edge damage. On some, there was foxing. There were sometimes creases in the artifact from earlier folding, sometimes water damage. And finally, there were degrees of dirtiness to report. Right. Reporting degrees of dirtiness is subjective <laughs> and vexatious to say the least. <laughs> I really can't set any criteria for determining what is very dirty, slightly dirty or somewhat dirty. <laughs> but I do at least hope what I reported was useful. There's about 2,000 artifacts I looked at over the project. I only found one where the artifact had been stuck to its protective package. So I think that's testimony to how I'm. Just for completion, I was asked to make any Additional notes, but I didn't. I suppose now we come to the key thing. So I just said there are about 2,000 artworks in the collection that I looked at. So what did I find? So the main reported findings were there was some variation between head and coa in four cases, considerable variation in five, not recorded in head two cases, not recorded in coa two cases. And this one, which was a bit strange to you, duplicate Koha records determined by mark record number. Now, if you've used the online catalogue, or if you haven't, uh, it's a fairly conventional catalogue. You key in 
perhaps the name of an artist, an artifact or a site or something you're interested in. <coughs> and the system presents to you what it calls normal view and you get a catalog entry. But it's a computer system, so it also has what's called a mark record for each record. You can click on that. It tells you the same sort of thing that the normal view tells you, but in a rather unfriendly format. But it also has other information that's crucial to how the system works. But the fact that there were duplicate records of that kind is quite worrisome because it means that the system um, gets out of uh, kilter. But there are, uh, seriously, it was. I only found four cases of that. Uh, eight artifacts I found weren't catalogued at all. Uh, two art historical observations. Uh, well, in a sense, they were me getting a bit carried away with knowing a bit about art history. But they were really where I felt uh, we could say a lot more in the descriptions. One of the things I did find, and some of you may be familiar with that, is that when you're reviewing these uh, descriptions, this exercise, you have to remember that the archivist's job is to get you, the researcher, to the thing you're interested in. It's not to try and do your art history for you. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but you'll be pleased to know, thanks to me, there are two cases where, where it has been done for you. <laughs> Uh, there were some small discrepancies in five cases on uh, location data, and some there were six occasions where, in my view, there were uh, six weak or confusing descriptions. Um, so there's not very many findings there out of 2,000 artifacts. And I do know from the work I did at the Oriental Club on writing a catalogue how um, uh, tedious, even though you're interested, it can be. And I did this after the first year of doing this project, I did feel that I could recognize a catalog entry that had been written on a Friday afternoon. Uh, I'll mention a few findings. Um, uh, there's an archive box labeled Todd Possible. And in there are a number of A3 sheets with rubbings of coins. Now they struck me as very similar to other Todd artifacts I had already seen while doing this work. After spending a few hours examining them against known Todd artifacts and illustrations in the journal's articles, I concluded on the basis that some were exactly the same as the journal illustrations. Some of these sheets were not possibly Todd, but were Todd. So I wrote a little report on this. Um, and in the future, a Todd expert like Norbert Peabody can uh, verify my conclusion. There are some odd things I found. Um, I found a pictograph, clearly from North American indigenous peoples. And I referred this to a friend of mine, Dr. Max Karochi at Goldsmith, who became very, very interested and came to see it. And in the end, we worked out that it was probably brought to India by Sir William Colebrook, who had previously been in uh, New Brunswick. Uh, there were some cuneiform descriptions of bricks. And to my untutored eye, I had no idea what they were. But thanks to a very helpful Dr. Monica, Monica Palmero Fernandez at Glasgow University, all was in revealed, including to my embarrassment, which way up to hold the artifact. Uh, there was another find, and I really regret that I didn't do uh, a slide for this. I found a rather nondescript watercolor of a house uh, in the Kulu Valley in uh, Northwest India, which was painted in 1882. And I couldn't believe it when I saw it because I had taken a photograph of exactly the same house in 1982 when I was in India myself. I mean, all I'm reporting to you is a coincidence, but it's, it's one of the fun aspects of doing this. So I mentioned some of these partly to illustrate, you know, the sorts of things you can find, but also, you know, it's fun to do these things. So recommendations were made during the course of the audit and where they were related to housing and packaging, they were either taken up and acted upon on the day or judged unnecessary. The remaining recommendations I had were summarized and reported as with any set of recommendations, they're to be taken up, not as the report's recipients be fit. So finally, I uh, wrote a report and submitted it to Ed and to Emma, who was the archivist at the time last October. And so having been asked to exercise my professional experience, I should uh, seriously give reassure you, as well as a society, in my professional judgment, this is a good audit. This is a good result. Um, 
you're coming here to research this stuff. We want to know you can find it. You can. We want to know that the descriptions and the catalogues are reliable. Well, they are. Some artifacts in Koha are, are not in Head, and I think that's to be expected given Head was published in 1991. Uh, that's, there's some variation in Head and Koha is slightly concerning in the cases where Koha appears deficient to Head, because I suspect nowadays people's first access will be to the online catalogue. Uh, that some items have not be catalogued is not a concern, in my view. Any catalogue is work in progress given new acquisitions. Uh, and as I said, having compiled a catalogue somewhere else, I know how hard it is to write a catalogue nowadays. Uh, personally, I suppose I should say that in most commercial audits, I would be looking for some kind of control where somebody did it and somebody else checked it. Uh, I didn't do that here because I thought it entirely disproportionate to the society's activities. But the key thing I think for you as fellows and other researchers watching it is that this collection is well managed and it's a testy to Ed and Nancy's work and it should be an encouragement to you and fellows as researchers. So thank you for listening. And I think we have questions again. Well, thank you very much indeed, Ian. Um, uh, I, I, have, I have to mention, of course, that the, the cataloguing, um, we rely very heavily on, on legacy catalogues for our, our, and for all of our collections, actually. Um, so both the manuscripts and artworks, um, we, we, we do very much, um, we, we're relying on work that has been done by previous um, scholars, librarians, curators, and so on. Um, and that is the basis of most of our much of our knowledge about 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 the collections, and that's what the um, the catalogues are based on. But we we do our best to make to make it accessible and consistent. So we're very grateful to Ian for his his work assessing assessing that and for presenting it this evening. Um, so we have one more presentation before we um, move on to questions, um, and the. The last uh, presentation uh, will be from uh, Jean-Baptiste Lamontre, um, who is a doctoral researcher in the history of linguistics at CNRS, um, which um, uh, the English name of which uh, will be the, the, uh, the French National Center for Scientific Research, um, which is in Paris. Um, and Jean-Baptiste's background is in linguistics, and he has a master's degree from in ALCO, um, the National Institute for Oriental Languages and Civilizations, um, or in layman's terms, the French SOAS. Um, uh, and Jean Baptiste will describe his experience um, studying the drafts and personal papers of Brian Horton Hodgson, um, often um, uh, known as the father of Himalayan studies. Um, and I, I know that um, uh, Jean-Baptiste has made an inc incredibly uh, exhaustive and thorough examination of Hodgson's linguistic papers, and I'm very much looking forward to, to seeing what he has to say for us this evening. So, Jean-Baptiste. So it's just a. Do you want the fountain? Um, I'm fine. Don't oh, worry. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Edward, for the nice introduction. So uh, I can't begin without uh, thanking the society uh, for doing me the honor of uh, inviting me to London to deliver this quick talk. As Edward just said, uh, I'm going to present on my experience with the uh, Hudson collections, an experience that took place last year from September to December, uh, thanks to a scholarship uh, granted by the Laboratory Empirical Foundations of Language based in Paris. 
I'm talking about the Hodgson collections with an S as uh, Hodgson's drafts, uh, personal papers and annotated books are in fact scattered across London and Oxford. The British Library at the, uh, wait, here, at the Zoological uh, Society, uh, at the Natural History Museum, at the Berlin Library in Oxford, and of course in this uh, venerable institution where I spent uh, the better half of my stay last year, and where I'm uh, especially indebted to the curators of the collections of Dr. Edward Weech and former archivist uh, Emma Jones, and the director Alison Orta for their warm uh, welcome and uh, constant availability. Um, a distinguished audience, such as I am lucky to have tonight, is more likely than know, more, more likely, sorry, than others to have heard of Brian Hodgson. Uh, so uh, Hodgson was a British resident of the court in Nepal. Well, first he was assistant resident uh, from uh, from memory from 1820 to 1834, and then he was full resident until December 1843, when he was removed. Uh, by the new Governor General of India, with whom he uh, didn't get along very well, to say the least. He retired in '43, so he got back. Uh, he got back to to England. He got back home. He got fed up very quickly with the bustling city life of Victorian London and the duties uh, that came with uh, being an honorary member of so many learned societies uh, at a time. So he went back to the Himalayas, only to return for good. Uh, in the aftermath of the mutiny, so in uh, 58. He's mainly remembered in the history of Orientalism as a manuscript hunter and a major purveyor of raw materials for the study of the early history of Buddhism. Most notably, he did not demonstrate exclusive uh, national preference, and although he did enrich the collections of this society with a fair amount of material, uh, and also the collections of Bodleian Library in Oxford. He also entrusted um, the French scholar Emile Burnouf, uh, sorry, Eugène Burnouf, <laughs> Emile was the father, with the study of a good part of his treasure trove, uh, which is still kept in Paris. And some of the two men's correspondence is kept here in the, at the society and attests to the, to the high esteem in which they mutually held each other. Uh, but Hodgson is perhaps best remembered for the natural historical specimens and drawings that he generously donated to museums throughout Europe, and more generally speaking for his contributions to natural science, which make up about half of his uh, scholarly output. So this is an example of what we're talking about. Uh, this, is not, this is not part of this of the collections kept here, but this is at the, the Natural History Museum. Uh, I, I know that one of the purposes of the of this evening is to promote the collections here, but still, I, I had to mention it. I had to. I couldn't uh, uh, refrain from uh, presenting that to you. Uh, so he, Hutchin is notably reported to have described thirty nine new species and genera of birds and mammals. Uh, that these achievements were certainly low hanging fruits as he was the first European traveler in Nepal with enough time and means to devote to that kind of leisure, doesn't preclude our admiration from the mastery he demonstrates in a field in which he was completely self-taught, uh, as in any other field, by the way. But no wonder zoology is the part of Hodgson's work that has received the most attention on the part of contemporary historians of science. One monography, I, I, can, I can mention well, briefly one monography by uh, Kalkar and Inskip in 88, two recent articles by Lover, and several chapters in collective books, including Waterhouse's collective book, The Origins of Himalayan Studies, um, which is here, sorry, here, The Origins of Himalayan Studies, so you can see the logo of the society on the uh, right, um, left and right, uh, left and bottom corner. And there's also that one book from the Natural History Museum editions, uh, which is intended for general audience, and it's the only source I can think of that devotes as many pages to Hodgson as to, for example, Darwin. But as a historian of linguistics, I'm of course primarily interested in Hodgson's philological endeavors, which, although they have been relied upon ever since by specialists of Himalayan languages, have not inspired much scholarship in the field of history of science, to say the least. At most, I can mention, um, well, there's one article by uh, Boyd Mikhailovsky, 
a French linguist who skimmed through Hodgson's field notes some 20 years before I did myself, and who published uh, some original material that Hodgson didn't, didn't deem uh, appropriate for publication. And there's also one chapter by George Van Dream in that, in that book on the left. George Van Dream is the acclaimed Tibetan uh, uh, well, he was in He was based in Holland, now he's in uh, Bern in Switzerland. Um, and, and he also published, um, he had also published a previous article where he discussed the value of one of the grammars written by Hodgson. Uh, I will say more about that later. So that leads me to the question of the very purpose of my doctoral research. What is there to find in Hodgson's linguistic draft and papers that can be of any use for researchers today, you might ask? But my purpose is twofold, as I'm trying to incorporate my research both in the field of descriptive linguistics and in that of uh, history of uh, science, but namely history of linguistic theories. But I have just mentioned that Hodgson's linguistic work has always been used by subsequent, sorry, I, I'm, I'm just noticing that I, I passed over one um, slide very quickly, it was that one. It, it's, not, it's not completely uninteresting. It, it shows you the amount of, uh, the, the, the volume of uh, published pages that he devoted to each of the fields of knowledge that he cultivated. So as you can see, um, uh, zoology represents a, a a good 40 to 45 percent of what he, of the total of what he uh, of, of his total output. Um, but later on, in the in, in in the late 40s and in the 50s, he devotes uh, much more time and effort to uh, languages, uh, which make up around one third of his total output. Um, so I have just mentioned that Hodgson's linguistic work has always been used by subsequent generations of linguists. I think it was that, wait, where is it? <laughs> okay, it was that slide, sorry. I didn't are in the wrong order. So this is um, this uh, map, uh, I, I've reported on the, on the map, the areas where the languages that he documented uh, are or were spoken. Since the, since the 1850s until the 1970s, Hodgson's grammars of Kiranti languages, so Kiranti languages are spoken in Eastern Nepal. That's the, the thicker circle. Uh, his grammars of Kiranti languages were the only existing descriptions of these languages. The chapters that deal with them, with those languages in the Linguistic Survey of India, uh, entirely rely actually on Hodgson's descriptions. In the 1920s, an American linguist um, Stuart Wolfenden published brief grammatical sketches and specimens of some Kiranti languages other than those that Hodgson had described, but that, that was about it, until my, Mikhailovsky finally went to Nepal in the 70s and improved after more than one century uh, on Hodgson's description. As Fandrim relates, some of the languages that Hodgson had provided vocabulary, vocabulary, vocabulary lists of, sorry, have died out in the meantime. So uh, some, of, some of Hodgson's articles are still valuable today as the only traces that are left of some obscure languages now gone extinct. But there's another reason why grammars written in the 1850s are still relevant to us today. And I'm referring to the issue of diachrony, that is how languages evolve with, um, with the passing of time. As Fandrine again suggests, uh, the, the conjugation in Bahing, one of the Kiranti languages, one of the, one of the, one of the two Kiranti languages that uh, Hodgson wrote uh, grammars of, the conjugation in Bahing looked much more complex in Hodgson's times than it looks today. So earlier descriptions can be informative uh, regarding how, how morphological complexity uh, can uh, decrease, dwindle over time. So that's it for the, for the descriptive linguistics dimension of my uh, research, research. Now I'm moving on to history of ideas. Uh, I, I could go on for three or four hours, but <laughs> <laughs> sorry, as I, as I said earlier, feel free to stop me when you've had enough, okay? <laughs> By all means. <laughs> um, what I'm eager to shed light on is why Hodgson's voice was so marginal in the great philological debates of his own time, while he had so much to contribute, especially when it comes to demonstrating that uncivilized, so to speak, uncivilized peoples from the Himalayas 
could as well speak languages incredibly more incredibly more complex conjugation wise than those of Europe. So was he was he too last century? So the, the first reason I could think of at first is that he was a proponent of a major linguistic family encompassing all the um, all the non-Indo-European and non-Semitic languages of Eurasia, uh, the infamous Turanian uh, hypothesis. So that, that threefold classification of languages was, of course, an inheritance of the biblical account of the three sons of Noah. It became untenable uh, with the advance of research over the course of the 19th century, and it became obsolete, actually, during Hutchinson's own lifetime. But still, it remained fashionable until well into the century, well into the second half of the century, actually. So even if that part of Hodgson's work doesn't appeal to us, to us anymore, it cannot be the only reason why he was ignored uh, in his time. But here I think, well, when I, when I say I think, I, I'm not the only one to think it, and I'm not even pretending to be, uh, to be original. I'm just, I'm just shopping around for ideas in the, among the various uh, uh, paradigms that have been proposed in the field of uh, history of science. But I think that the traditional um, conception of sciences as mere uh, sets of ideas, sets of representations, theories of methods concerning a, concerning a given object is insufficient, actually, to capture, to capture the reality of knowledge production. The material and social substrates of knowledge production have to be factored in. That is, first, the, the time, for example, the time it takes for ideas to travel at the time of sail navigation, the circulation of journals, I mean learned journals, uh, scholarly journals, the, re the reliability of journal printers, and especially the goodwill that they commit to deciphering drafts that have come all the way from Kathmandu or Darjeeling to Calcutta, without being able to call Hodgson to confirm how an accent or how a subtitle uh, should be rendered. That's what I've called the material substrate. And then there's what I've called the social substrate of knowledge production, that is the, um, the very competitive, back in the day as well as uh, nowadays, the very competitive world of academia and scholarly journals where the production of knowledge takes place, and more largely the ideological background of the elites and their readiness to welcome or to oppose new ideas promoted by scholars. As for the first point, so the, uh, that is the reliability of the printed editions of Hodgson's works, a careful comparison of the transcriptions in print with the transcriptions in the drafts uh, is in order. And that's the first reason why it's, it is important to resort to the, to the manuscripts and not to content oneself with the prints. Um, have a look, for example, at uh, the disclaimer, uh, the disclaimer that the editors of the Journal of the Asiatic Society of Bengal inserted in volume 26. That was published in 1857. Um, <laughs> so since this presentation is only... <laughs> <laughs> You've seen that. <laughs> it's, yeah, I, I find it great. <laughs> so this um, presentation is only intended to be a, a taster, as Edward told me when he first proposed me to do it. So I'm not going to delve into the details, but the diacritical marks, indeed, uh, in the manuscripts are different uh, from those of the printed materials. And there are also reasons to believe that Hodgson used the same accent, for example, the, the acute accent, for different purposes, varying from language to language, or, or to believe that he used different transcription schemes, uh, depending on whether he was transcribing written data from an Indian alphabet to the Latin alphabet, or whether he was uh, writing down words that he heard directly from an informant speaking to him. As for the second point, the, um, uh, the, the, the circulation of Hodgson's ideas and the impact that he had on the intellectual landscape of his time, it is crucial to resort to the personal papers, especially the correspondence with fellow linguists. For example, there are many letters kept here in the, uh, at the society and um, in Oxford as well, 
and it, uh, and th these letters are very informative as to um, who he sent his works to. Most of his correspondence are just well. M most of this correspondence is just uh, consists of polite acknowledgement, but some of the letters give also feedback, and that's important. Well, that's uh, of a major interest to me. But beyond the pleasantries of the correspondence, we can get a sense of what Hodgson thought about the works of his colleagues by looking at the annotations that he left in the margins of their books. For example, look at that. Yes, and well, that, 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 that's, uh, yeah, that, that's an example of what we can find here uh, kept at the society. Um, sorry, where was I up to? Um, it's well, so I, yeah, I, I was saying it's important to look at the annotations that he left in the margins of his cor his fellow his fellow linguists' books, uh, but also in his own books. Um, but it's what can be informative also is the lack of said annotations. For example, there is here in the collection a fascicle about um, a long-range language comparison that was written by some uh, Hyde Clark. Uh, historian, specialist of the Middle East, and uh, after a few pages, Hutchinson had stopped entirely to add annotations, and there are even some uncut pages of, after that point. So I think that that speaks volumes about what he thought actually of the of the quality of the book. <laughs> so it's well, that, that's the kind of reasons why it's necessary to do um, archival work, uh, because if well. If, we, if, if you only look at, that, uh, at the printed materials, you can't get a sense of uh, that, that, that kind of things, how, how he was, what kind of relationships he had with, uh, with, uh, with his fellow uh, linguists. So I'm not going to uh, linger on uh, any longer. Um, just to conclude, I was, uh, I'd like to say that this is only the beginning of a, of a larger project. So it's, it's my PhD, I should have mentioned it at the beginning. This is only the, the beginning of my, of beginning of my uh, PhD project. So it's, uh, it's a project that will uh, take me for uh, years, uh, and I have I think I have now enough material to to uh, to go on working on it. Um, uh, well beyond uh, the well beyond the completion of my uh, of my thesis. So you, you yeah you you are likely to to hear from me <laughs> sooner or later. Well, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Jean-Baptiste. Um, the Hodgson collection is uh, extremely um, extensive uh, and dense and rich. Um, and we're very pleased um, that uh, Jean-Baptiste, someone with such energy and imagination, has, uh, has been tackling it in such a, uh, such a thorough fashion, because there's a, there's a lot more to be said about, about Brian Hodgson. Um, so we, we've come to the end of the presentations, but we'd very much like to take some questions. So I don't know if the three sp uh, speakers would like to join me at the, at the front, and we can take um, questions both from, from the audience here at Stevenson Way and also from our guests online. Um, so I will turn on the room mics. Now on. Um, and yes, open the floor to to questions. Um, I think first of all, I would just like to say myself that it's particularly um, uh, salutary to have three contrasting presentations, which cover, I suppose, the, the different ways in which, well. The, between the maps, map collection, the art collection, and then an archive focusing quite heavily on linguistic studies, we see the, um, the study or exploration of Asian civilizations through a very, one, extremely visual 
um, format, and then another hyperverbal format in, in through the linguistics. Um, so it's a it's a it's a very um, we've we've covered the gamut of um, of human expression through these three presentations. Um, so yeah, sorry, um, please. Yeah, just a very quick question for John Baptiste. Um, the Royal Library in, um, in Kathmandu has an enormous manuscript um, archive, which is, I think, quite a lot in sort of like school. Did Hodgson find some interesting things there? Um, as far as I know, it's not there, but he found all those uh, Sanskrit manuscripts. Okay. He found these in uh, monasteries. Rather than in the wrong. Yeah, do, do, he, he find them dormant in forgotten libraries and yeah, in temples and monasteries. But, but by the way, I, I'm not even sure that that library existed at his time. Oh, didn't it? Okay, so maybe, maybe. I'm, not, I'm not sure what I'm yeah. uh, putting forward. Um, You'll name what's now. Richard? Could I uh, just mention also to our last speaker um, that when the um, book by David Waterhouse was published. 2004. Yes, that's right. Um, subsequent to that, um, the institution which I was then working, the British Museum, we found some Hodgson material in the basement. Really? What kind of material? It's not linguistic, so don't get too excited. <laughs> it was um, watercolors of uh, different uh, Different groups, um, maybe gurus, I think. Oh, gurus, okay. Mm -hmm. um, there are about a dozen mm -hmm. sheets, I think. But um, sadly, we didn't know about them when David was doing all that collecting of data. But um, you might want to add them to that list of that. I might. But the, the list was inexhaustive but by any means. Uh -huh. uh, I know there are also scattered papers elsewhere. But... Those are only the well. The, the, the collections I've talked about are only the major collections. Right. Yeah. Uh, Lionel, oh, just there was a, they were terrific. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there was just one thing about. I wonder if you mentioned about the Ceylon manuscripts. Is there any idea of where they went to? The, uh, this once in a the other thing was a very interesting uh, that map by Rajendra Lala Mitra. I mean, it makes one think of, uh, well, obviously, linguistic uh, sort of regional nationalisms, Congress at Nagpur in the 20s. I mean, I, could, I couldn't see from here. But did that, was that Mitra's idea of linguistic Bengal, or did it follow uh, the boundaries of, you can't, of the province at that time in British India, did you? I, I wonder if it was... In other words, if there was a subversive element in making it a different Bengal. Um, well, to the first question about the, um, about the maps, Ceylon maps, I mean, Ed would probably speak to this, but I think the, the collection is a history of things just going. You know. <laughs> Not recently. <laughs> Not recently, <laughs> but back in the other. Um, I mean, they, they, I, I would love to trace where these Ceylon maps end up. Who knows, maybe in the, in the British Library, for example, might have it today, but um, yeah, no idea where. Um, in terms of the Mitra Atlas, that's in, um, no, that, that is the province of Bengal, the presidency, but um, the, the, the atlas itself is interesting because he does, just does it, it's the Bengal atlas, so he doesn't do other parts of India, as far as I know. And there is a later political afterlife to these Bengal atlases in the sense that other regional movements in India and provincial areas, right. there was a sort of resentment against the sort of the Bengali elite. So, you know, writing, mapping in Bengal, but then forgetting that there was Korea, other languages, they didn't have a sort of vernacular or um, their own map culture. So, <laughs> The map itself has a sort of interesting after the atlas itself has an interesting after afterlife in India in terms of other movements being not hostile but sort of resenting the fact that these Bengali intellectuals are publishing all these atlases in Bengali but or neglecting the other languages of India. Um, and we actually have um, Philip selected a few maps um, which we have in the in the reading room, um, which which will open once we finish once we finish the formalities here. But um, would you like to briefly introduce just what, 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 you've, what, what we've got upstairs? Because there's one or two that you didn't 
that you didn't cover in the presentation. Um, just, just so people know what they're, what they're, what they're going to get to, yeah, to see. Um, there's one of them with drought, wasn't there? Yeah. And then there was the um, vernacular, vernacular. Yeah. So the uh, society has an, um, um, a map sent by an, um, a publisher in India called Devendranath Dar. Not really much known about him. He just he seems to be a self-taught cartographer. So he made his own maps in Bengali, which he wanted he wanted the society support to publish further financial financially, so he could publish these um, vernacular maps for schools in India. And he, the, the, included with the map is his correspondence with the society, where he's really trying to get the members to sort of support his project. I don't think they do, but um, so that map's upstairs. And the other one is an interesting sort of early tourist map of Madras, um, or at least that's the way I see it as a sort of tourist map. It's a sort of visitor's map of the old um, uh, Madras in around 1830 by the, the, Hindu, the Madras Hindu Literary Society, which was a sort of society, companion society set up um, because the, the Madras Literary Society would not let Indians participate in their society. It was only for the British. So they set up a sort of companion society. And one of their maps, it's an interesting map. I assume it was a sort of, they would hand it out or give it to visitors to India. At least that's my speculation. They would give it to visitors in India. And so that's also upstairs. Oh, thank you very much. It's interesting, the um, Dvendranathar Dvend, 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 um, writing to the society for, 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 in the hope of support. The society has often, over the centuries, has been in a position and rarely often willing to offer moral support with alacrity, but has rarely been in a position to offer um, support in more, more con concrete terms. But, um, but we're very, we're very Fortunate to, have to still have the still have the original map. It's quite a um, it's quite a remarkable uh, thing. Yeah, so, so I should and I should say that there is a sort of history of the society that's forgotten in the sense that this society has published maps. Not didn't have the equipment, but they were very much involved. When I mean, you look at the old journal articles, very much a sort of cartographic culture at play in the society throughout its history. Yeah. Not just collecting maps, but actually making or involved in the making of maps. Yeah, I can support some of the uh, some of the artworks I looked at um, weren't really artworks; they were really sketches done for cartographers. Um, so, yeah. Quite a sketchy artwork, and then they have annotations, principally I think for military purposes, describing elevation and scarp and angles that they'd seen, and, and occasionally a little personal note, for example. Like, it's a nice place to see bumblebees. It's <laughs> 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 a little insight into the chat. <laughs> so just to remind you, if, any, if anyone in the audience, uh, in, sorry, online has any questions, they can just submit them in the chat. Um, I'll just give it a bit longer just in case anyone online does have one. Mm -hmm. Do we have any more questions from, from people here? Um, if not, then unless anyone is going to um, furiously type something, um, then I think we can draw proceedings to a close. Before we do so, I would just like to thank each of our speakers um, again for joining us and for such such interesting um, presentations and for all their work with the collections. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.